Welcome to the Japanese Whiskey World. I'm your host, Kilara Sen. July 7th was Tanabata or the Star Festival in Japan. It celebrates the meeting of the married deities Orihime, known as Vega, and Hikoboshi, Altair. According to the legend, Orihime's father got angry at the couple that made the Milky Way separate these lovers, and then they are allowed to meet only once a year on the seventh day of the seventh month. And it said, if it rains, they cannot meet. It's just like a love story of you and the Hibiki 21 years old. <laughs> oh my dear, when can we see next? I would totally cross the galaxy for a nice hour of Hibiki 21. Anyway, this year, July 7th, it didn't rain. But unfortunately, Orihime and Hikoboshi couldn't see each other because of the Japanese immigration restriction. You zoom! You love birds! Uh. During the Star Festival, people write their wish on a piece of paper and hang that on a bamboo tree in the hope that the wishes become true. It's just like when Americans hang their socks on the wall during Christmas. Except our pieces of paper don't smell like feet. I bet you're wondering, Kilala, what did you write? Well, first, oh, thank you very much for asking me. Of course I wrote, Hibiki 17 years old, Hibiki 21 years old, Hakushu 12 years old, Karu is about 50 years old. Yeah, it just became an older shit. Today, we have another special guest. He is Brad Jeffy. Brad Jeffy is a food, spirits, and a travel writer. He moonlights as a beer and a spirits consultant, hosting appearings and educational dinners in Los Angeles and New York, and curating drinks menus for festivals and restaurants across the country. Please welcome Brad Jeffy! Thank you, Lara. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate ah, it. Brad how did you become interested in whiskey and in particular Japanese whiskey? I remember going to a few bars like back in the early 2010s where, you know, the, some of the, the prominent Japanese whiskeys that were already marketed at that point in time, be they Nika or Suntory, of course, they did a really good job of putting the kanji on the, on the bottle and creating this fascination. I don't personally, I don't know uh, what it says in kanji, but I, I, I want to get it closer to me and I want to understand it. I want to have somebody to explain it to me. So it's kind of begging you to question it and, and, and ask questions about it. So that was something that was really provocative for me. It was just the way that they presented these labels. Also, I had one of my very good friends from college and mm -hmm. he always said to me, you know, you should come visit sometime. This was like, again, like around 2008, 2009. Uh, it was my first time learning about uh, Mizanara oak and the impact that that can have. And it actually was one of the first places where I really fell in love with sherry whiskey. And then mm. the Japanese kind of like really got me into understanding the beauty of balance and meticulousness. And so once I had those experiences in Japan, anytime that I would open a bottle of Japanese whiskey back at home, I was back there and it was a really magical kind of connection to have. That sounds cool. I, I know it's very, very hard to choose, but uh, you you traveled a lot in Japan. And where is your favorite place to travel in Japan? I would say Hakushu. The, they have these barrel warehouses there that are so large. Like, it's just like, you know, it seems like they're stacked up like 20 high. Like, you have to like strain your neck to like <laughs> see the top of this warehouse. It is very strong the odor of whiskey in the air it almost like burns your nostrils. It's so, so strong when you're walking through that particular warehouse. 
I see, I see, yeah. So right now, I'm actually, uh, I brought up something really special that my friends at Nika had sent to me earlier this year, and I finally had a chance to try it. And believe it or not, it is a 50-year-old um, Miyagikyo. Uh, hey. This was their, fi- yeah, this is their 50th anniversary malt that they released uh, a bottle from Miyagikyo and a bottle from Yuichi earlier this year because uh, 2019 was the 50th anniversary of Mika. They sold out obviously immediately. There was only like 250 bottles of each one released. So very fortunate to be able to sample this. How does it taste? Imagine just drinking an ice cream sundae, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's such sweet. And it just has a slight little hint of um, a little bit of smoke in the finish a yule log burning in the distance and you're smelling almost like a little bit of incense like a little bit of sandalwood very nice now it's like i'm back in japan see and i didn't even need to get on a very long plane ride so what do you see as the future of japanese whiskey well i definitely do think that transparency is really really important and um you know as it becomes more apparent to uh, American whiskey drinkers and maybe people outside of Japan that there are you know, a lot of whiskeys out there on the market that might label themselves as Japanese whiskey but n- might not be at all from Japan. We just, you know, people just want to know really more than anything. They want to know what goes into the bottle um, and they want that transparency. And I think that it really benefits all producers in Japan. I would think that the Japanese producers probably most of them want it to be that way, but you know, apparently there's too many that have been profiting off of the system being the way that it is right now. So it won't be until that moment where there's enough native Japanese whiskey ready to release in the warehouses, in the barrel houses, that all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know what? Yeah, we should change this now, you know? But I think that that is a very, very important thing uh, for Japanese whiskey is to get those laws clarified and also to form basically like whether it be like we have like the Stewards Association or like the Scotch Whiskey Association to have this strong unified group that unites everybody and they're all on the same page. And uh, what is your favorite ever Japanese whiskey expression? To me, I love Yamazaki 25, unfortunately for me, because it is far, far uh, outside of my price range. To me, it's it's the highest expression because you're not just getting that beautiful, those beautiful dark fruit notes and those complexities and the sultana and the dark raisins and the things that we all love about uh, sherry whiskey, but also because it's as uh, aged for as long as it is, it has some of these like leathery roncio notes so that when I sit there and drink it, I have a sip of it like I did of this 50-year Miyagikyo and I just sit there and like, I can't speak for a few moments because I just have to like, let it sit. You know, if you're a very talented distiller and you're making a beautiful distillate and you're using incredible, impeccable cooperage, some of the stuff that I've tasted that's only three years old, like the newest stuff that comes out of some of these really highly anticipated distillers, it's incredible. You know, and you taste it at three years old and you're like, holy crud, like if this is what it tastes like at three years, imagine what it's going to taste like at five years or 10 years, you know? I see, I see, yeah. Do you have any website or...? Uh, social media, I'm uh, on Instagram, uh, which is Journeys with Jaffe, which is my last name, J-A-P-H-E. Mm-hmm. See the things, you know, I like to tell stories about things that aren't mm-hmm. so immediately obvious. So, thank you very much, um, Jeffy-san. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. new markets as coronavirus happens whiskey empire in the film lost in translation bill murray declared for relaxing time make it sanctuary time but these are not relaxing times for sanctuary holdings its biggest market japan the state of emergency emptied out bars, restaurants, and karaoke clubs. Although the customers are now returning to entertainment venues, the outlook for the drinks business is one of the prolonged upheaval. 
Yes, I'm missing Japanese businessmen sleeping on the last train. Generally speaking, most of Japanese people don't believe in any specific religion. But just look at the passengers on the train. They are all like. Meditation. And I often join them. Nothing is more comfortable than the shoulder of a sleeping stranger. And you should see the late night trains. Drunken Japanese businessmen are rolling on the floor or laying on the seat like little bus Nirvana Buddhas. <laughs> Tonight we have a special guest from New York and she's an amazing Japanese lady. Yoko Reika no Kimura is a highly talented master of both the Japanese koto and the shamisen in traditional and contemporary music. Born and raised in Saitama, Japan, she showed a flair for music from a young age. She has since earned glowing reviews from the likes of the New York Times, taken home numerous awards and has played in some of the most renowned venues in over 20 countries across the globe. I'm very pleased to have her, so please welcome Yoko Reikano Kimura! Hello! <laughs> have you always been very musical in your life? Uh, yes, um, uh, when I was 10 years old, uh, I studied Koto. Then, <laughs> uh, when I was 14 years old, that's so all I decided to be a professional Koto player and started very intensive training with my uh, current teacher. Yeah, music has been always together with me. Wow, that's great. At 14 years old? Wow. You are uh, from originally from Saitama, Japan, right? So which part of Saitama? Uh, so my hometown is Higashi Matsuyama City. Okay, you know, uh, the, the famous Japanese whiskey brand Chichibu is also in Saitama, right? Yeah, Chichibu so, is a really nice place, yeah. <laughs> what is your favorite Japanese whiskey? Ano, Santori. パトリーさんの、うん、日々日々ですとか。うん、いや、アクチャイマシャミセンティーチャー、うん、シーリアリライクスドリンキングソン。サムタイムシーインバイテミヨコちゃんとレッツドリンクトゥギャザー。オフコ
Could you tell us a little about the song you're gonna play? Okay, so I will play a small excerpt from a classical piece called Seki Heki no Fu. Uh, it means red, a uh, battle of red cliff, uh, composed by my teacher's teacher, Kinichi Nakamoshima. Thank you very much. We are very excited to hear that. And maybe a lot of people got interested in your music and your style and your performance. So uh, where can we find out more about you and your uh, schedule and your performance? Mm -hmm. uh, so I have uh, my official website. So please just Google Yoko Reika no Kimura. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Domo arigatou gozaimashita. Gozaimashita. Oh. 
has innovated its way out of crisis based on the founder's words, yatte mi na hare, meaning just do it. Well, I think the English word for that is Nike. Sanctuary has put importance on the connection of people made by drinking. And an old Japanese saying expresses this miracle as once in a lifetime meeting. Just like Orihime and Hikoboshi, we should be experiencing unforgettable meeting and be dying to see each other again with someone and of course some whiskey. Oh, and in the Nikkei Asian Review, one of our first guests in this show, Liam of the communication blog was cited. See? This is also one great meeting brought by Japanese whiskey. So guys, go check it out. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we have a special and famous lady from America. <laughs> so Kat is a food and a travel journalist who dares to do things differently. She's the author of a low alcohol cocktail book, Day Drinking, and the amazingly titled Unicorn Food. A cookbook about nature's magic foods that are as colorful as they are healthy. So please welcome Kat Odell! Konnichiwa! Your uh, food is really colorful and uh, uh, why should we all be eating beautiful rainbow colored food? The foods in nature that naturally have colors like blueberries, like pink grapefruit, strawberries, uh, purple cabbage. These fruit, these foods are <clears throat> very rich in antithiocins, which are a type of antioxidant that combat free radicals in the body. They're just really, really good for you. They fight against cancer. And also that's pretty, right? With all these different colors, because naturally when you look at something, when you have all these different colors, you gravitate more toward that than something that's like white and brown. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the natural color is the most vivid color, yeah. right? I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from your previous writing, uh, you seem to draw lots of inspiration from Japanese food. What appears to you about Japanese food and ingredients? Everything is done better. It's prettier, it's more perfect, it's more thoughtful, but it's higher quality. I gravitate toward Japanese cuisine because it's there's a respect for ingredients and flavors. Every, every, the chef is seeking to highlight the natural flavors of those ingredients, not to adulterate those flavors. Mm -hmm. and, I, and personally, I gravitate to a really clean, pure natural flavor, which is what you get a lot in Japan. And then you have a lot of use of fermentation. So, you know, misos and soys and dashis, and there's lots of seaweed and kombu. And all that creates so much umami, right? Mm -hmm. So there's uh, this balance of umami and purity of natural flavor that for me is, you know, the most perfect um, way to approach a dish. And also you are uh, making very delicious and beautiful cocktails. And uh, do you have any particular flavors you like to pair with Japanese whiskey? One cocktail that I do like to make with Hakushu 12 is it's basically a mix of Hakshu 12 and uh, Umeshu. So you get a little bit of sweetness for the plum with the smokiness from the Hakshu and it's an amazing, amazing, amazing mix. Japanese whiskey is so different because there's this nuance and there's this elegance and this um, refinement that I definitely don't find it in like bourbons and ryes. They're just so kind of like heavy and clunky and really sweet. From the perspective of Japanese whiskey, how do you think about its uh, Japanese craftsmanship? What it sort of comes into play when you talk about um, mastering crafts, craftsmanship is attention to ingredients, but, but the attention to every single detail that goes into making a product like Japanese whiskey. I think Japanese whiskey is an incredible and a perfect example of a shokunin product, a craftsmanship product. And what, what I've learned a lot about Japanese culture, whether it's food or beverages, and within the beverage category, cocktails or whiskey, everything is about balance. It's important to have balance in anything that you're creating. I think Japan is more sophisticated um, and you have just the most stunning, complex, 
elegant, not heavy, not cloying, these like ethereal whiskeys. Yamazaki 18 for me is one of those whiskeys that are just so unique and special. And that's why I love Japanese whiskey. Oh, good to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Doitashimashite. <laughs> wow, well, so I'm, I'm sure a lot of people got more interested in you. So uh, where can they find out uh, about your uh, work and the books? Sure. Um, I use Instagram the most and my Instagram is just at cat, K-A-T underscore Odell, O-D-E-L-L. Thank you very much, Kyoto-san, and uh, uh, Nihon de aimashou. <laughs> Yo! Guys, thank you very much for tuning in to Japanese Whiskey World! I believe you enjoyed it! So please, 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 please don't forget to subscribe our the counter YouTube channel and follow social media. And also don't forget to subscribe my YouTube channel, Kirara Comedy, and my social media's Kirara Comedy, please. Well, in Japan, actually, it's getting back to normal life a little by little. Yeah, in this show, I really want to try to introduce the real Japan as much as possible. So please look forward to it. So until the next episode, please be safe, please be healthy, and please be happy. Of course, I gotta start drinking from now. My current favorite whiskey is Chita. In this small bottle, you can get this at convenience store here in Japan. Yes. Uh, this bottle is just a smartphone sized bottle. So I call my Chita Smart whiskey. Mwah. Ah, you are smart. So when you go to work, don't forget to put your smartphone and smart whiskey in your pocket. <laughs>